Hey everybody, it's Mark Pattison, former NFL player, now climbing the seven summits, and welcome to another fantastic episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. Okay, look, seven, eight years ago, I had to step into the fear and put a big-ass goal out there, and so I decided to start climbing all these crazy mountains around the world. It's been an absolute amazing journey. And, you know, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I've actually done six of the seven. I've actually been on Denali twice. I've been on uh, Climb Successfully, Kilimanjaro twice. But now it's Mount Everest, the biggest boy on the block, 29,000 plus. And I'm headed over there April 2020, and I'm totally keyed up. And I'm keyed up because I've been doing all this preparation. I, I train like an absolute bear. And... Um, really putting myself in a position of success. I'm going to be climbing with one of the top climbing outfitters in the world. Excited about that. And uh, just the mountain has fascinated me for years, I'm sure, like others, but uh, really excited to do so. And so if I can actually pull this thing off, I'd be the first NFL player to do so. And so as we speak today, there's not that many first in the world. So uh, I look forward to tackling that. Okay, so that's one. Two is I totally appreciate the lesson on these different podcasts. I really do. And uh, it's been an amazing journey, as I said, from um, not just interviewing these people, but being on the other side of the, the the mic and really taking in their incredible stories of doing amazing things. And look, we all need to be inspired. And so if I can help provide and find more people that meet that criteria, all the better. And uh, it just, we all need that, that, uh, that motivation. And we all need that those words of encouragement that you can make it back relevant to your own situation and then plow forward in whatever endeavor you are trying to do. Okay, so I appreciate that. And uh, if you want to find out anything that I have going on, you can do so at markpattisonnfl.com. I've got a book out now called Finding Your Summit. Go figure. And it is essentially the playbook to uh, what I had learned from my Hall of Fame coaches on how to emerge and do some great things in your life. It doesn't have to be mountain climbing, of course. It can be anything, but it's 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 a plug-in that you 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 take on these different these different things, these different goals, that these different strategies that that I've set forth, uh, that they set forth for me, and good things can come from that. Okay. Also on the website, you can find out more about my expedition. Obviously, I'm be going to I'll be going to to Mount Everest, and we'll have more information about that coming up. There's an e-learning course and, of course, the podcast. And when you go to the podcast, you will find an iTunes tab. And I would be so grateful if you go in and you'd rate and review. Now, it all has to do with visibility, popularity of podcasts, because there are so many podcasts out there today that it's so easy to get lost and like, wait, where's Finding Your Summit? And uh, I think I really do believe these stories are, are really amazing and, and incredible and can really give a lift to those people who really need it. And even if you don't, we all need to be motivated and, and uh, inspired by other people to keep going. So if you'd go in and do that, I would be really, really appreciative. Okay, so look at, let's go listen to the pod. It's going to be awesome. Here we go. Hey, everybody, it's Mark Pattison. I'm back with another incredible podcast called Funny Your Summit. Look, I am so jacked up. I've been chasing this guy around for months and months and months and months and months. And he has been like a elusive grizzly bear off uh, exploring all four corners of the earth. And in part, that's one of the reasons why it's taken me so long. I was originally inspired to reach out to him after I saw a movie called Maru. And uh, it just sent chills up and down my spine uh, for what he and Jimmy Chin and a third guy had accomplished. And, and so from that, I was like, I've got to get Conrad on. We, in some, in some, at some level, share the same passion in terms of being in the mountains and exploring. And so, so the first thing would be, Conrad, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me on and uh, greetings listeners. Yeah, no. So, uh, hey, listen, I, we're going to go through a whole lot of things. And, and you know, you, when I was doing the, the background check on you, I mean, there was as much of any person I've, I've, I've done. I've done a lot of prominent guys and girls. And um, one of the things that really caught my attention was this quote that you had. So stand by for this. We don't just measure greatness by the peaks that we climb or the heights that we reach, but rather by the positive impact 
that we create for ourselves, our communities, and our planet. Our goodness to reach each other is what makes us whole and what endures for generations beyond our physical feats and achievements. And to me, Conrad, considering the amount of physical feats and achievements that you've um, had in your life, uh, to me, what that says right in front of me is that you just get it. You're one of these guys that has experienced life in a very unique way. You've been able to create a lifestyle for yourself around mountaineering. And, um, and when you really start talking about a positive impact, about paying it forward, about really taking the things that you learned, about impacting communities, about affecting other people, about inspiring people like myself to go out there and do what we can do, that's just a positive voice that we need to have in, on this planet. Well, thank you. Yeah, it, um, I always wonder where that quote came from or what the context was was uh, from it. But it was, yeah, something that we think about. We, as climbers, we're, we go do mountains, we climb them. And it's a very selfish pursuit, and we're the only ones experiencing that. And we come back, we share a little bit of it, but the risks and the consequences are carried by our family and friends. And that, I guess, to make up for that risk that we that our measure is what we contribute to humanity and the planet. And so we're rather than just taking it all for yourself. What can you do with, um, what can you do with your, where you're at and how can you make our place a, a little bit better? Yeah. So there's a couple, there's a couple places I want to go with the word measure. I think, you know, one in terms of paying it forward, I've been lucky, lucky to be involved um, in a organization called Water Boys, many of my listeners have heard this before, but it's, a, it's an organization that Chris Long had started. He's the son of uh, Howie. He just retired from the NFL and happened to be the, the 1919 Man of the Year, which is the person in the NFL, one of 32 guys who contribute the most in terms of a real impact back in that community. He started an organization where you raise money and awareness to go down to uh, Tanzania I'm sure you've been there. Go out into the uh, Serengeti and visit with the people of the, the Maasai tribe. And the goal is to uh, raise enough money that we can build water wells um, down there. They've got a saying called, water is life. And that's so true. So these young girls don't have to walk with five, five miles with five-gallon buckets on their head to go down and get attacked, get raped, and other bad things that happen. And really have a community that you've got pure water coming out. And then in, 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 as a follow-up to that, then we go and we climb Kilimanjaro, which I've done a couple of times now. But I mean, from the, the measure side, you're so right. I, I, I found the mountains. I mean, I've always been in the mountains being from Seattle, but I found the mountains through going through some adversity on my own. But what a gift it has been, like this opportunity to go down and participate in a, in a effort like this to really impact the community. I know you've done things like that in, especially in Nepal. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And um, having been to Kilimanjaro, I was there in uh, 2016, so it's nice to see those people there. And throughout the world, the amount of time that women spend getting water is uh, is something that, um, if you were to have a, an economist tabulate all the hours and how much time that they had spent there, there's a lot of time that could be spent educating their children or working on their garden, doing needlework or just relaxing and enjoying life rather than carrying water. So um, it's commendable that you're working on that in that area there. And, you know, as we bring water and water continues to be a focus point on what humanity needs, it's good to see that. Um, and then my own connection is uh, to Nepal through uh, with my spouse, Jennifer, and mm -hmm. it's, uh, with the Kumbu Climbing Center. And it's a vocational training for high altitude workers. And that's uh, based in the Kumbu region of Nepal. And we're um, 17 years of uh, running the program. So it's in Nepali hands now. And they've, they're um, taking over it. And there's a building that goes with it that's also a community center, center for the small village of Fort Say. Well, that's incredible. Again, you know, going back to the, the, the quote, which we, we started off with about really trying to contribute in any way that you can. You don't necessarily have to go to a faraway land to, to lend a hand and pay it forward to, to different people. The other word that I wanted to use in terms of what we're talking about is measure. I like to go on these different journeys. You're talking about it's, it is risky for sure, especially some of the things that you've done. But when, when 
I, I guess, you know, so I'm headed to Everest this next April. And a lot of people are concerned, especially after what happened this last year. My tent mate from Antarctica in January was the first American out of uh, Salt Lake City, Don Cash, to pass, to go. He's still sitting up at 29,029. And so for me, I kind of take a look at it from the opposite angle is what can I do to reduce the risk and be in the 97% of the people that actually get up there and survive and have a successful climb versus the three or 4% that go up there every year and, and find themselves like Don did un, unprepared then in the log jam, then in a situation where he's up there for 19 hours and then bad things happen, you know, post that. Yeah. And I'm wondering from, you know, some of the things like uh, shark's tooth or shark, sharks. Yeah. No shark's fin that the, 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 the peak that at the time, the unclimbed peak that you did in the movie Maru like, how did you see that? Or how have these various expeditions, when you've been on Everest, how do you measure that? Like, what do you do? Yeah, so I've been to Everest three times, um, yep. 1999, and then again in 2007, and then 2012. And um, each of them was a different experience. Um, 2012 was, um, I did it without supplemental oxygen, but that was... Um, a crowded season. There was only four days of good weather. So previous to this season's image of the lines at the uh, Hillary step, they had the line of the, the photograph of the, let's say, face of people all um, backed up on that. But when I was up there, I didn't have any, I waited and I, I wasn't there with the crowd. So being, going, letting the crowds move ahead of you or not being up there on that same day does make, um, make for a little bit, uh, a little bit easier. Are you be climbing on the north side or the south side? I'm going up the south. Yeah. So yeah, you'll be you'll have a good idea of of when everyone goes. And weather forecasting is far more accurate now than what it was ten years ago, twenty years ago, or we think back what it was like sixty years ago when you know, it was first um, and what 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 it must have been like in 1953. So there's far better weather forecasting, primarily with wind. Um, understanding where the winds are, so the jet stream, and that's your big adversary when you're up there. And that um, if it's calm and you're in a cloud, then you can still climb. But if it's clear and windy, you're just getting um, yeah. buff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the invisible enemy. <laughs> yeah. Well, a guy that I'm climbing with when I'm down there, who's a friend of yours, is Gary Madison. So oh, yeah. you know, I, again, you talk about measured risk. Me moving my entire life to some valley living at 6,000 feet, climbing every single day, doing CrossFit in the morning, doing all the physical things that I need to do, having the right gear, having the right outfitter, yeah. having a guy like Garrison that's been up there now, I think he's summited 10 times where he certainly has knowledge. He works with the local Sherpa that are there, helps set the lines, all this kind of stuff, all the things that I know you've done. But to me, you know, when you start looking at how can I – put myself in the best position of success. To me, that's what that means. Yeah. Going with Madison Mountaineering is uh, you're in good hands and Garrett runs a top drawer operation and he always has some um, great staff and knows what's going on and is responsible too. So yeah, he leaves in 10 days or so for a um, post monsoon go at it. So oh. wish him luck on that. Yeah, that would be incredible. All right. So let's go back a little bit. Um, I started a little bit forward with you, but I do want to go back and I want to like the roots, like you've got this drive again, you were with me still be with North Face for the last 25, 30 years, something like that, which is incredible um, as a North Face athlete sponsoring you, you know, throughout the world to do this stuff. That's my nirvana. That's my dream. And it's really hard to do. And there's only, they, they, they only pick a few people in the world to actually fulfill that and, and go forward with that. You know, I know you, another guy that I climb with here in some valleys at Beasters, um, guys like that have been fortunate, but you've also put yourself in those positions. So going back, did you grow up in Salt Lake City? I know you went to the University of Utah, but where did you get that connection? Where did you get that hook for wanting to be in the mountains and explore them? Yeah. So my father's side of family is from Tuolumne County in uh, California. So it's uh, sort of the northern half of the um, 
of Yosemite National Park. And so it's the Tuolumne River drainage that, is, that makes up that county. And so as kids, we'd always get up into the high country and we would do mountaineering and climbing things and whatnot. And so, and my mother, um, both my parents have passed away, but my mother was um, from uh, East Germany, so near Dresden. And so the Elp Sunstein, so the, the sandstone, she wasn't a climber, but there was relatives within the family that went out there. So it was somehow, I guess I, I was introduced to it at a young age. And then once uh, I, living in Salt Lake in the 80s, moving there in 81 onwards was a big opportunity because there's a great place to train for alpine climbing. And you can climb water ice in the winter, ski, and then there's three different types of rock, right? There's granite, quartzite, limestone, right within uh, an afternoon's climbing opportunity, and then you can drive down to Sandstone, or you can get out to City of Rock in Idaho, so you're really centrally located, and it's a great place for um, for climbers to be. So I was fortunate to to land there at a time when um, climbing was really taken off, and um, it was probably in the late 80s, 88, 89, that the, in hard sport climbing, it kind of moved to uh, to Salt Lake City and environs um, with the American Fort Canyon and some of the other limestone canyons in there. So that um, as things had sort of, as, as newer and harder routes came through, that was, um, it was a pivotal point in, in rock climbing and then also the amount of climbers that were living in Salt Lake and pushing the standard. Hey, this pod is sponsored by Laird Superfoods. So many products to choose from, from your InstaFuel, your coffee, your tea, your smoothies, and I love the superfood creamer and use the hydration powders like the beets, the coconut, the matcha, the turmeric to mix all into my Seven Summit smoothie. And it's so good. Log on to LairdSuperfood.com and get your 20% off when you use the code MARKP20. Okay? So get your Laird Superfood and I guarantee it will help fuel your journey. Certainly, you can be a influenced by your surroundings. No, there's no question. Um, I've become friends with Laird Hamilton and Gabby, and you know they live down in Malibu and live in Hawaii, and you know they're on the beach. So he's a big wave, wave surfer, and that's not something that I ever grew up around. I did grow up in Seattle. I do, did grow up around the Cascades, Mount Rainier, right in front. I'm sure you've done Rainier, and you know you, there's no question that you can be a product of your environment, but you also have to have the passion behind it. And where do you think that hook do you, again, going back, was this your, from your, from your father or from your mother, or was there friends that said, Hey, you know, you're, this is on weekends. You're at the university of Utah. Let's go up. Let's go on the mountains. I know you were buddies with Bug Stump was, yeah. I think he was a Utah grad as well. No, um, Penn state. Penn state. Okay. So. Yeah. And there's some, um, I mean, if you look at it, I have uh, three siblings, two sisters and a brother and, none of them are passionate about you know, crazy about mountain climbing. And they were all exposed to the same amount of family pack trips with mules and the high Sierras and fishing and kind of living that wilderness experience. But yet it took with me. And so that uh, it, maybe I was, my factory setting when I was born was set on climber and <laughs> I was fortunate to find it at a young age and, and be able to follow that passion. So, um, but yeah, the encouragement from my father and his buddies. And so they were, they were really literally kind of showed me the ropes at a young age. We'd get out and they would um, uh, take us out in the seventies and, and going up peaks that were just walking. And then eventually heading up to Mount Rainier at age 16, that was, I was like, well, you got to have a, a glacier and a crevasse to make it, <laughs> uh, to make it like a, a challenging climb. So that was always a, a fun thing. I went back there a few years ago and the route that we had done was the Gibraltar Gap and it doesn't exist anymore. It's <laughs> a product of climate change and the rangers chuckled when it goes up a different variation. So all real interesting. Yeah, I was just uh, on Rainier a couple of weeks ago and I was, um, well, this goes down a whole nother path, which I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on, but we, we, I was asked to co-guide up there. And, uh, one of the guys that was on the, uh, in the group was a Navy SEAL. And, um, I just expected, I guess, in my mind that he'd bring other guys that were as fit as this guy was. He brought three of his friends and they had no business being on a mountain. 
And that's what I keep running into. That's my, my, my one thorn in my side is I keep uh, signing up with these expedition groups and, and there's always somebody who shows up that shouldn't be there. And yeah. <laughs> you know, you've, you've, you put yourself in a very great position that rather than go with a company like Madison Mountaineering or something, you're guiding your own handpicked crew. You, I know you've got a relationship with John Krakauer, the author of the In the Thin Air book and Jimmy Chin. Lucky you. And if I were picking an NFL team, you know, I would go out and find my NFL buddies. You know, I wouldn't find guys off the street who don't know what they're doing in football. So I totally get that. Yeah. But that's been a frustration of mine as I've I've entered into this game. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I basically um, quit guiding in 1992. That was when Muggs died. And I had been guiding and I'd done a few trips. Um, but uh, my mother was like, well, you can well, you're, you know, go climbing and have fun at it. But don't uh, don't go guiding. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Was, uh, yeah. When I was young, I would. Uh, kind of uh, take friends up half dome, so to say. Yeah. It was obviously what I was doing, but I remember my mother was like, you're going up without, you know, was, she gave me an earful, so. <laughs> yeah, well, that's an intense rock. It's, I love going up. I have not been up the, the probably the face that you're talking about. I've been up the the stairs, you know, yeah. on, the, on the other side that goes up. I want to talk to you, uh, Conrad, about some defining moments in your life. And I think there have been that have really jumped out uh, on the screen to me. And I want to talk about 1999 to start with. And, and if I have my date slightly wrong, correct me, please. But I believe that was the year that you were in Mount Everest. And yeah, 1999. Yeah. 1999. And you, you were tasked with going out and trying to retrace the steps and then find George Mallory's body, who is the first really British explorer that was up there, that there was this controversy. Did he make the top? Did he not? And he was carrying some kind of a Kodak camera which i probably my, my sense is that you were trying to also locate that but at the end of the day you did find his body um and i'm not sure what the final conclusions are but tell me about that particular trip yeah so it was uh, 1999 the uh, mallory and irvine research expedition the team leader is eric simonson um owner of international mountain guides yep. and um Dave Hahn was uh, sort of the climbing leader. He and I had guided together in Antarctica, so he invited me on to uh, the uh, onto the climb with about two weeks to go. And part of it was I, there was a film that was being done, and my goal, um, my task on it was to have a go at the second step. So um, not having had previous altitude experience above 7,000 meters, that this would be, you know, see what it was like, and then just try to have a go at the second step and see what sort of conditions and what sort of climbing they would have had to be able to do in 1924. Um, but it was on the 1st of May that, um, with the help of my teammates, that I discovered the body of uh, George Mallory. And it was a, uh, a very humbling moment where always stand on the shoulders of those that come before us and someone that was there 75 years earlier, what they did and their, their effort and their knowledge of the mountain was then passed on to the expeditions in the thirties and eventually in the fifties when it was climbed, all that is a connection to those prior generations. And so there's a, a level of respect for that. And, um, but the question is, could they have made it to the top on that uh, fateful day, June 8th, 1924? And um, as um, much as it would be great to say they had summited and they were on their way down, it, it seems improbable due to the difficulty of the uh, the cliff band at the second step. So it's, there's, it's we went back in 2007 and with Leo Holding, we were able to free climb it, pulled the ladder away and had a go at it. And it, um, it was, it took a lot of uh, effort and modern climbing technique and gear and, and things like that, which they didn't, they weren't really using. Um, they didn't have pitons and yeah. years in the twenties. The, the rope was there as a sort of a, a safety backup that would keep you, you know, from a small fall um, to re your build to fall like you would in a climbing standpoint. And, the second step is a vertical crack. So and, and to, to say, oh, that they had down soloed up and down it would be, um, and it just is a stretch of the imagination because the, um, 
collectively, the climbing standards weren't at that level. But that doesn't take anything away from what Mallory was able to do, what he stood for, and what um, the ethos of the time and what climbing was like. Yeah, I've, I've seen these old pictures of some of the, the expedition teams that were up there. And uh, I mean, I, I can't compare it to today's full suit gear down all this other stuff and to be up there in tweed pants. And I mean, whatever they climbed in, you know, just, it just seems impossible, you know, just yeah. from a clothing standpoint. They had about seven layers on and um, nylon wasn't invented until the uh, second world war thereabouts. And so, and they were just getting into down feathers as an insulation. Um, yeah. the earliest down jackets were, um, as a result of those pioneering English expeditions. But as long as they were moving, they were okay. Um, and you're aware of that. As long as you're moving, you're, you yeah. have warmth. But static warmth, so when you stopped moving, there wasn't that insulation that down and nylon and waterproof breathable fabrics bring to you. It just, the heat would just dissipate instantly. And even with silk long underwear and then woolen long underwear and then, um, oiled cotton cloth which is what they that was what their wind jackets were made out of um yeah and things that we take for granted nowadays like zippers yeah the first zippers came sandy urban used them on 1924 expedition he was an early adopter of technology and it was um he had zip pockets but didn't have a zip that ran up and down the front of his jacket and you think about what it would be like to have a collared jacket in this sort of like a dinner jacket nowadays. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. So how in the world, you know, it's almost like finding a, a needle in a haystack, right? So you've got this massive mountain range, you've got this massive mountain, Mount Everest, and now, you know, you're looking for this guy, George Mallory. I mean, like, how do you find of all the stuff going on was there's a lot of calibrations that were going on. What, you thought he was at and he must have fallen in the likely spot. I mean, how does that work? Leading up to the expedition, Jochen Hemleb, who is a, uh, a research historian, um, a German fellow, he was part of the expedition and he had, he was really keen on this um, had worked with uh, the, the historical archives of the Chinese expedition and then on to the later ones and had, had tried to piece together where it was. And, to the best of the team's knowledge, the, the likely spot for the English dead, which was how the Chinese climber had described it to the Japanese climber, and that's how the news got out around the world in um, 1980, um, was closer to the yellow band. And as we set out that day there, um, four of my teammates were up in the search zone. And then as I wasn't, I didn't have supplemental oxygen and I wasn't a, um, uh, specifically set out to as a searcher I was more of the second step I was contouring below and so the idea to fan out is as wide as possible and to um, go to a different area so it was uh, a contouring on in that area but then also the bottom of the snow slope was in a um, was uh, probably you know, going back to the work I had um, on Denali as um, as a volunteer ranger there, and when you do body recovery, they they end up in certain positions in certain places, and it's just the the physics and the nature of the mountain and the way the human body is. We're more top heavy than we are bottom heavy as yeah. we're standing, right? So there's certain things that go into that, and but it was mostly luck. You know, forever thankful for the team for inviting me on that and then being out of the search zone and, um, and then radioing out to my friends and, uh, and, and sort of the news kind of then went around the world. Yeah, I mean, it's just a absolutely unbelievable, you know, tale of adventure, but also sadness and, and all the things that are wrapped around that. But, you know, it'd been really cool that you could have found the uh the, the kodak camera too i know that i mean that's just a whole nother layer to it but you did it also in that year 1999 tell me if i'm if i'm right or wrong is the year that you that you experienced and went through that horrible avalanche that you were partially buried in yeah october 5th on shisha Pungla. 
Yeah. And look, this is, um, and again, we get into another defining moment for you and probably a hard moment for you. Cause I can't imagine my best friends, Jim Morrow, when we climb all the time together here in Sun Valley and you're with your best buddy, Alex Lowe. And, uh, this massive thing comes down. You guys were actually taking a rest day. You go out and somehow or another, this thing fell down on you and you're running for your lives. Uh, I've been in several avalanches, not directly on top of me when I was on Denali the last two years in a row. And it's just what happens in the mountains and hopefully you're out of range. I mean, do you, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time in it, but you know, are, are there, there are ways to explain what that must've been, that moment must've been like when this, this, this mother nature caused natural event is coming down the mountain and you're like, shit, you know, and you guys are trying to fan out and trying to get away from it. I mean, what was that like? We were, out acclimatizing and we um saw our teammates on the other side of this glacier and thought we'd walk over there and and meet with them and we were walking across a run out zone <clears throat> and when you have uh glaciers at uh 5600 meters at that elevation in the Himalayas the result of avalanches so you have this massive snow fence, which is what the mountains are, and then they build up snow and they avalanche down. So it makes for quicker, easier passage, but it's also more dangerous. And so that's sort of the the double challenge of the ice fall on Mount Everest and that same throat, wherever you're at. And so we were walking across the uh, runout zone, and then a there was a release of um, of uh, of an avalanche up there, and it was. I mean, we had a moment of awareness and then we started running and this we went from sort of a cognitive decision making mindset to autonomic so where you're just at the most reptilian part of your brain and survival takes over and you're just how can i save my life hey i'm excited to introduce our new partner of the pod cascade mountain tech an outdoor brand from the Pacific Northwest, which is where I'm from, that offers a great selection of trekking poles. They're incredible. Super coolers, camp chairs, LED lighting, and much more. Right now, Cascade Mountain Tech is offering 15% off your first order by using the code FINDINGYOURSUMMIT15. That is, FINDINGYOURSUMMIT15 when you check out at CascadeMountainTech.com. So... Again, I'm going to make a connection here in a second, but again, your your buddy Alex Lowe, you know, does not make it out of this, and I, I can't imagine what that must have been like of having your best buddy, you know, you've done all these climbs with you guys very close, and I know the way it can be when you're in the mountains with these people. I mean, it takes it your relationship with anybody even to another level just because you're so exposed for so long. That void in your life, you guys had climbed a lot. Um, did it take you a long time to find other people? Maybe it was like Jimmy Chin to start to climb with or? No, we had, there was always friends around and it was always, yeah. and then at first it was, you know, should I go back and continue doing this when it, you know, when it, it, it it's that level of intensity and danger that comes with it. So, um, but yeah, there was some, um, it was always great to have climbing partners around and to be with them and to do things. Um, but it, um, Probably the um, after that, Jennifer and I, we grew in love. And, and then um, in 2001, we got married. So, uh, so, let's, so let, let's let me back up the story for the yeah, So the community, climbing community, because you're fairly prominent within, we, we, we probably know the story, but uh, the, the net net story of this, your buddy Alex was married to his wife at the time, Jennifer. They had three kids. And everybody was living in Bozeman, Montana, right? And and so now when you came back, you felt a responsibility to help her raise these kids. You guys were just friends. And then over time, as you said, you guys fell in love. And actually, a very beautiful story came out of this. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, that was um, a lot of the case. So there's, um, you know, initially the um, at, that, at that avalanche dealing with um, the... Uh, Two things: the, the the traumatic syndrome that you know that goes on with it, just the the, the physicality of that and the near miss, and then and losing someone. And then the other one was uh, survivor's guilt, which puts a lot of a lot of uh, 
it's a difficult one to identify. But then when you walk away and your friend is gone, there's a lot of introspection that goes on there and you sort of question life. Um, yeah. It was a tough one. I, I can only imagine. I want to spring forward just a little bit. And I want to go back. And, and in, in the movie Maru, tell me if I have my mm-hmm. facts straight here. In the movie Maru, which, by the way, I've seen it two or three times. Absolutely brilliant. And I'll, I'll come back to that. But Jimmy Chin is in a scene where, well, obviously not stage, but he falls into a, uh avalanche scenario where there's this massive snowfall. It's coming down the mountain. He's tumbling. He's turning. And somehow or another in the in the avalanche gods, he ends up pop back on top of this whole surface, not buried underneath. So I, I think you were there when that all happened, correct? Um, not this. The avalanche was in uh, the Tetons. Yeah, there's in the Tetons. Okay. Yeah. So okay. that was the spring before we were to head over there in the post monsoon. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't remember the exact detail of that. And what I was going to ask is, you know, certainly was there a flashback if you were there, but you weren't there. So. Um, just an incredible moment. I, I, I just want to go w- one moment back again with your, your with your long time now wife Jennifer. Um, I've got a buddy Bo Ellis who married a gal with with three little girls. Um, they've been mar- married now 15 years or so. But I mean, my hat is off to you for carrying that torch and 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 helping those kids and getting them through and being that rock, you know, in that family when things seem to be going off the the rails. And it takes somebody, a stand-up person, to be able to take on that commitment versus, you know, like, you, you didn't have to do that. And you, you did it for all the right intentions and reasons. Well, thank you. I appreciate your, uh, your, your kind thoughts. Yeah. No, I, they're sincere. So let's talk about Maru now, right? Something a little happier. The, the movie, first of all, where did, that, where did that whole thing come out of? And again, for those people who haven't seen it, Maru, um, these guys, Jimmy Chin, Conrad and there's a third guy I don't know his name but they went on to take on Sharks Fin this route and it was incredibly intense you guys had to do it a couple times it'd never been climbed it's basically this massive 22,000 foot ice and rock face that you got to go straight up and um, you guys ran into all kinds of issues not to matter um, that it was freezing and in you know, the, 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 all the equipment and sickness and this and that, but you made it through and you got to the top. Yeah, it was a long process. And so the first time I had to go at it was uh, 2003 and got totally schooled and then came back in 2008 with uh, Jimmy Chin and Renan Osturk. And so the third member of our, and we got, oh, about maybe a hundred meters or so from the summit. And it was just, we were, it was just too risky and if we'd been out we the problem of something coming a, a small mistake kind of getting larger into being a pro um becoming epic was very real and so then we came back in 2011 so and there would be no film without uh jimmy and renan so they yeah hats off to them and they made that all happen I kept asking myself, who in the hell is filming this stuff? It was great footage. And it's just, you guys are hanging by a rope, you know, going up these faces and just to capture all those moments was brilliant. And uh, so it's good to know it was those two that was, that was filming. In 2016, another defining moment in your life, you're up, you're climbing and, and you have a heart attack, right? It's just like, like I'm looking at you, you look great. I've seen you on, on film many times, you know, you're super fit. How does a guy like you have a heart attack? And now you're talking, you're on a mountain and, and uh, you're high up and just, just the whole battle of trying to get you off that mountain and in a position uh, in Nepal to get you back to Kathmandu for that surgery. Yeah. Well, you know, I was an asymptomatic uh, patient, so it might've been a genetic, but uh, I had a, a blockage in my left anterior descending. So it um, it's not unheard of and it's not uncommon, but um, yeah, I'd always thought that, <laughs> you know, you push things away and, and it's, but um, yeah, it's, it was difficult. And then luckily to get a, uh, uh, an, an air, airlift out and then to have a, a cardiologist in Kathmandu that was um, capable of doing the procedure and, and putting that stent in. So and had that not been there, it probably would have been the end of the story. 
Well, fortunately, it wasn't, and you continue to go on. And um, the last thing I want to talk to you about really quickly is you've got a affinity for Antarctica. I was down there in, in 2019, January, uh, six, seven months ago. Fascinating place, you know, going down into Punta Arenas, taking the charter over, being on that plane with a bunch of drunk Russians <laughs> that were, were going to, I think, bike or something to the South Pole. I flew over with another guy you probably know, Vern Tejas, and we went up um, to the top of Vincent Massif uh, and did that. But um, somehow or another in there, you got this wacky idea, this great idea to go and try to climb these six peaks, I think, that had never been climbed down in Antarctica. And um, on one hand, that surprises me. and the other hand, that doesn't surprise me because it's so remote. I mean, not a blade of grass, nothing green that grows down there. So what was that like? The, uh, the trip to... Uh... The, the the Ellsworth Range or the one to uh, the Queen Maud Land? Well, the, didn't you, you were with Alex and a, a few others? Yeah, that was Queen Maud Land. Yeah. And so we did that 96, 97. And then 92 to 2002, I guided on Benson. And I'll be going back again there this season to do one trip with uh, Garrett. But um, yeah, that was um, mostly just the, 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 the stark simplicity is... Uh, is an otherworldly beauty and it's an environment that probably hasn't changed in the last 250,000 years. Um, whereas yeah. here in Montana or Sun Valley, I mean, there's been climate has changed and glaciers have approached and receded, but it's been a very static environment. And there's this sense of timelessness that comes to that, which is heightened by the austral summer where it doesn't get dark. So you're, um, you're down there. So yeah, there's, um, in the Ellsworth range, there's, uh, seven principal summits within it and that that kind of formed the spine of that and missing out on Epperly. So I got to go get Epperly and then, but I guess it's sort of gathering stamps or something. <laughs> well, it keeps pressing on, right? So, so now I know with your heart attack, um, you're no longer doing super high altitude peaks, but what is your range? Oh, I mean, it, it, you yeah, probably don't need to go above 5,000 meters or something like that. I mean, I've been up to, to five, three, five, four, um, a few times since the, the incident, the coronary incident. So, but yeah, it's, um, but it's also life is a linear experience. You don't need to go back to something you've, you've, you've done that and, and then find something new to do and see what that next opportunity in life is and not sort of be hanging Oh yeah, I'm in there and that. So <laughs> yeah, so doing the 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 conversion and defeat here, we're we're talking like Vincent, for example, sixteen six or sixteen something, you know, and change feet. Yeah, yeah. Ever Space Camp is uh, seventeen thousand feet. That's five thousand three hundred meters. Yeah. Um, and then so the uh, Chola Pass is about five thousand four hundred. I went over that and I've gone up uh, up and around there. But um, yeah, it's probably I can do it, but the uh, the, the challenge is, is that um, I don't have full function of my heart anymore. So there's been, there was a tissue necrosis in that nine hours between onset and the um, procedure going in there. So that um, I have lost some function, but do I need to go out and do that and do more of it? No, I'm good with it. I'm, <laughs> I'll find other things to do in life. <laughs> yeah. No, I get that. So which leads to my, my final question. So as you kind of push on from here, right, you've had this brilliant life. You've, um, you probably, I don't know what of the nine lives, what life you're on right now. I don't know if it's four or five or three or four or two or one. I don't know what that is. It doesn't matter. But as you press on from here, we're about the same age. How do you see that going? Um, yeah, I've had uh, three close calls with two avalanches and then that heart attack. And so those were the, where you, th where you think you're like, oh, this is it. I'm, I'm going to go. And the, aval the avalanches were immediate and you kind of come away with it. And you're like, oh, I survived. And then the heart attack was a slow um, sort of painful ordeal with kind of understanding where that is. And so, yeah, do I need to risk my life on that at, at that level as much as I do anymore? Um, no, I don't. And um, I've, I've had a good go of it. And I'm happy with where I'm at. And I'll still enjoy the mountains and have that intrinsic reward. But I don't need to be as competitive with myself or within the climate community to to try to go out and push the standards on that. So that was um, the good, bad, and the ugly <laughs> ringtone. But um, 
Yeah, I that physical. I, I don't need to do any more. But what um, my goal now is to you know what what can we do that's going to leave the humanity better going forward. And as a mountaineer, as the joke goes, I'm the eyes and ears of the mountain. How do they hear with mountaineers? And so yeah. <laughs> the mountains have no. There's no one that's going to come in there and say, "Hey, come take care of us." We as humans need to be. Able, we need to stand up for them and the other. People. Is that Clint Eastwood? Call no. All right. No, I, it's my. I had to turn my phone on to uh, yeah. ring her off, and so there's um, and I'm just my phone's going off. It's all good. But we're yeah. What I want to do the next twenty years of my life is to make positive impact on how we how we care for this planet and the people that we share this planet with, and the the animals and the plants that support our planet. And everyone's like save the earth the earth is going to be earth for another four and a half billion years till our sun becomes a what is a a a giant dwarf or or, it's going to burn out and envelop our orb and so in a four and a half million we're 4.5 billion years through the earth's we're about halfway so saving earth is saving planet earth is you know earth is going to be fine we need to save humanity and if yeah. we to save humanity we have to save the support system that we are dependent upon and that's atmosphere water and food and as you did your work in tanzania how can we feed uh, shelter and clothe the, the 7.4 billion people and ever increasing amount of people with the level of dignity that you and i are accustomed to so rather than using where i am in my position to to hoard more of it and just say i want more and give myself more money and give myself more stuff i'd rather use what little bit of um of notoriety i have as as a as a lever to create goodness um for for people so that's that's what it is um, no, it's, look, it's, it's 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 phenomenal and where can people um, learn more about your platform? Is it your website? Yeah, check out conradanker.com and then um, on social media, Instagram and on Facebook, and they're, and they're all in those. And then on my website, I do post uh, when I'm doing speaking engagements. And so um, catch one of those if you can and say hello. But yeah, I try to be open source. People send me notes and it's um, it's pretty low key. Everyone's like, oh, you're always signing autographs everyone's meeting you in the airport i'm like no yeah <laughs> maybe jimmy now that jimmy and honald jimmy and honald they get that they're they're rock stars so i'm my goal is to gracefully fade into obscurity well i no, look at i i don't th- i don't think i don't see that for you number one number two is um you know again i'm, I'm friends um with uh lou whitaker here. oh yeah yeah you know him yep lou and, and, yep. and, and, and peter and those guys yep then you know, it's just like there, there's a, I think there's a social responsibility for all of us and, you know, somehow or another, and I never, I never went into what I'm doing right now from being an NFL player to climbing these different mountains as looking for a platform or looking to have some kind of voice on something. But, but I, I have a number of people reach out to me and say, Hey, Mark, what you're doing is pretty cool. And I don't think of myself as an inspiring person because anybody can get up, put on some shoes and walk out the door and climb a mountain. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how high and how difficult might be a different answer, but everybody can be inspiring in their own way and everybody can participate in their own way and everybody can give and pay it forward in their own way. And so it's really about doing and seeking. And so if you can have a hand in that, I mean, awesome. You've done so much already. And, you know, I, I just see you continuing to carry that torch. I think more than anything, you're built like that. And for you to just sit home and just rest on some of the things you've done in the past, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not buying that at all for a minute for no, you. I'm not going to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, again, I'll, I'll kind of start or end where I started, which, which is number one, it's an honor to meet you. Number two, um, we need more people like you on this planet to, to make things, you know, operate in a positive way. And, and the last thing is, um, you know, keep doing what you're doing and being the stand up guy that you are to your kids, to your wife, and to the, the climate community and other people around this, this great, you know, nation and, and world. So thank you again thank for you being much. on. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Mark. That's, uh, that's great to hear. And it's, uh, yeah, there, there's, uh, yeah, I really appreciate you having me on the podcast and hopefully we'll reach out to people and they'll, um, be inspired to do things on their own and at their, um, 
It's uh, everyone has a different de definition of greatness, but whatever it might be, um, pursue it. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Well, uh, I'll know I, I have found my true greatness when I come to Bozeman and we run up the uh, the uh, the M, the little yeah. mountain up there, right in front of um, in downtown Bozeman. So, go ice climbing up in highlight. That's the I, hey, listen, I'd love to do that. I'd love to do that. So he is Conrad Anchor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Hey, thank you so much for dropping in and listening to another amazing episode of Finding Your Summit. Truly incredible people doing spectacular things in life. And I hope you were inspired just like I continue to be. Look, I am super grateful that you came in and subscribed to this pod and would be more than appreciative if you gave the show a ratings and review on iTunes. Trust me, it matters. And then also go share it with your friends, of course. Okay, until next week, go do something great. And remember, it takes a little more to make a champion. Bye. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Pattison, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So, until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.